Good morning. It's a ple pleasure to be here. Um, and welcome to all our panelists and to our guests. Um, this is the regional lightning talk. So I will go straight to first introducing myself. My name is Jane Munga. I am a fellow at the Carnegie Endowment um, for International Peace at the Africa Program. Um, and this morning, I'm joined by three experts in uh, China-Africa relations, um, and I'll introduce them. First, I have Joe, who's right next to me. Um, Joseph Asunka is the Chief Executive Officer of Afrobarometer. Joseph um, has previously been the Program Officer at William and Flora Hewlett Foundation uh, before joining Hewlett. Joseph was a lecturer in political science at the University of California, LA, where he taught courses on African politics. Um, political economy, development, and research methods. If you have not interacted with the Afrobarometer, I encourage you to. It's a, a great data set um, on perceptions of Africans. Um, the bios are long, but I know they are online, so I will also just uh, do a quick summary. Our next guest um, is Oscar. Oscar is, um, just told me he came from Nairobi, so welcome to DC. It was a very cold day <laughs> on this week to be here. Oscar Otella is a non-resident fellow um, with the Global China Hub here at the Atlantic Council. Um, he's a political scientist with 15 years of working experience spread across lecturing, research, and consultancy services. Over the past 10 years, he has lectured at six universities, offering his insights on political science, including comparative politics, international relations, and political philosophy. He has published a number of journal articles with journals such as the African Affairs and policy papers with the Council on Foreign Relations. Next, I turn to Paul. Paul is uh, no stranger. He was here in the previous uh, session. But I'll still go ahead and uh, introduce uh, Mr. Paul Nantulia, who is a research associate at the African Center for Strategic Studies. Paul researches and prepares written analysis on contemporary African security issues his areas of expertise include Chinese foreign policy, China-Africa relations, African partnerships with Southeast Asian countries, mediation, and peace processes, the Great Lakes, East and Southern Africa. Prior to joining the African Center, Mr. Nantulia served as a regional technical advisor on South Sudan for CRS, where he supported crisis mitigation with the government of South Sudan. So, I think this, that's uh, the introductions. I think we will go, like in the previous session, um, the organizers of this conference, and again, thank you to the Atlantic Council um, and the University of Notre Dame for having this session. It's going to be a lightning round, so we're gonna try and keep things moving quickly. Um, there is uh, some Afro-pop musicians who sang a, short, a song called Short and Sweet. I don't know if some of you know it. I won't ask you to dance, but let's try and keep it short and sweet as we keep the questions going. Um, we've been talking about the increasing China-Africa relations, and I want us to start on that conversation because I think it's interesting that we frame um, this discussion. And the first question will go to you, Oscar. And I want us to start framing this with Africa's interest in China. And then I'll come to Paul and who can tell us about China's interest in Africa. So Oscar, Africa's interest in China, how, does, how do African countries leverage their relationships with China to advance their own agendas and diversify their partnerships? What is in it for them? Uh, thank you, Jen. Uh, thank you, colleagues, for joining the panel and to our audience, both um, here at Atlantic Council and uh, those joining us uh, virtually. Um, it's interesting to join uh, the session to you know, shed light on African uh, interest, talking about uh, the leverage of African countries uh, from my own um, uh, works and uh, other colleagues who have uh, passionately uh, spoken about this uh, discussion. Um, we frame the question of um, uh, African um, uh, agency uh, from uh, a two perspective and just building from uh, what the previous panel have discussed. And uh, I know the ambassador uh, dismissed the idea of uh, Global South. 
um, some platforms, if you look at the published works in the third world quarterly, um, you know, the, the, the concept of Global South has been elevated to, 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 to higher uh, levels. But let me then use politically uh, correct terminology, <laughs> developing, <laughs> developing countries. And um, uh, from a structuralist uh, 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 perspective, uh, we see African countries um, you know, being part and parcel of that group. And if you, if you read and follow the rhetorics of uh, Chinese diplomats, as other speakers have said, uh, they are very um, specific on the use of developing countries when they are referring to African uh, countries. Reason, of course, uh, that has um, a historical connotation. And um, uh, the idea here is to evoke uh, the, 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 the colonial sentiments and, 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 and you know, forge that uh, sense of uh, shared belonging among African countries. So seen from that perspective, then African countries are simply a perceive China as one of them, a brother, a sister, uh, whom we have uh, a shared our history, we have suffered, and therefore uh, we can be able to engage uh, on equal footing, rather than the hierarchical <laughs> north-south or, or structural, you know that um, uh, you know north-south. Um, let's see each other as partners, all right, as equal, and 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 so we see China, you know, bringing in. Uh, interesting terminologies like win with win win situation uh, mutual benefits sort of just to um, you know extend extend and forge uh, you know uh, extended engagement that we have seen uh, since the turn of uh, a, a 21st century and obviously uh, the question of uh, what then is in is in a uh, place for African countries that has actually been the subject of our discussion, and we are asking now, uh, how are these countries uh, benefiting more? Uh, Paul and others um, in the previous panel have talked about uh, bargaining power. Who, who, who is bargaining and who is benefiting um, uh, in, this, uh, in this engagement? Where is the place of um, African people? Where is the place of civil society? That has been a question uh, myself and others have asked. And we have come uh, to the conclusion that uh, predominantly we are seeing uh, more and more uh, African political elite uh, driving and, and, and benefiting uh, in this engagement uh, to the extent that um, other, sectors, uh, other sectors of society are, are also benefiting. Uh, is, is a subject of uh, debate. But more importantly, as I let others to also join in, um, how then is the elite structuring mm -hmm. this power relation? That is important because uh, China is coming as, a, as, as this powerful actor on board. Um, are these elite, of course, speaking on behalf of African state, are they in a position as they negotiate to put up a strong fight against this uh, powerful actor. Uh, that then uh, gives us a room to start now questioning the extent of uh, bargaining power in this uh, space. So I, I, I'll stop this as I allow others to uh, ventilate uh, this thing. Thank, thank, <laughs> <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Oscar. And you've raised a very important point that I'm going to come back uh, to Joe because I know he does some perceptions. And we'll move down from what, what has been perceived. But before that, I want to hear Paul's uh, uh, view of this because now we've talked about China's interest in Africa. Let's take a look on the other side. I would want to hear what is... China's interest in Africa. So if we can frame your, your remarks on that, and how does China's involvement in Africa development align to their broader foreign right. policy, the BRI, and all these other things that you mentioned right, earlier. Right. Thank you, thank you uh, so much. And uh, it's, it, it's great, again, to be on another panel with uh, colleagues uh, uh, that, have, that have worked with and whose works that I, I really admire. Um, 
China in Africa is, 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 is part of China in the developing world, the emerging world, uh, and China in the world. It is not a, uh, China's engagements in Africa are not divorced. In fact, I think they are a, they are a subset of its larger, of its larger global um, uh, vision. So I think that's, 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 that's important. Uh, I might break it up in five key strategic elements. The first is uh, China has a profound interest in reminding African uh, audiences and African stakeholders about the journey it traveled with them uh, during the struggle against colonialism and apartheid. This is, why is this, why is this so important? It's, you see, China understands that modern Africa is young. Mo by modern Africa, I mean independent Africa. Independent Africa is just, what, 60 years? This is, this is, this is yesterday. Uh, the gentleman sitting on this table belonged to the first generation of Africans that were born uh, free. All our parents were colonial subjects. So the memories of colonialism uh, are fresh. Uh, countries like South Africa, 1994 was just, 1994 was this morning. <laughs> you know, Namibia, 1990 was, was four o'clock in the morning. These are recent experiences, and these are countries that are being governed by elites that were part of that. Not all of them were in armed, some of them were in the civic movements, in the civic space, and so on. But these memories are, are fresh. And I think China understands that very well. India as well understands that in terms of the language, the language that you see, the diplomatic language that you see when Indian diplomats uh, meet with their African counterparts, it's fresh. So I think that's the first element. And I think it translates into diplomatic support, which brings me to my second point, which is that China is interested in the numbers because Africa as a bloc is the largest bloc within the G77. It's the largest bloc within the non-aligned movement. It is the largest regional bloc in terms of plural, plural, plurality of members in the UN General Assembly. And these are, these are important forums uh, for you know, you know, uh, voting on issues of international, you, you know, international consequence and so on. And, and like I mentioned in the previous, in the previous uh, discussion, um, uh, African voting behavior in the UN and in, all, in, in other multilateral institutions is very, very important uh, to China. Not just China, but also other, other powers as well. So I think that's, that's, that, that, that's key. The more voices uh, China can recruit or co-opt uh, to uh, support its, 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 its policies, for instance, on Taiwan, its policies in Xinjiang, Hong Kong, and so on, the better for China, diplomatically speaking. So I think that is that is a, that is a key element. In terms of isolating Taiwan, that that that, that is a clear manifestation of this. Uh, Africa is a Taiwan-free zone in terms of diplomacy. Uh, only one country, uh, Eswatini, uh, recognizes Taipei. One. All the others, and this was not the case even 20 years ago. So that you know that. D diplomatic maneuvering is extremely important. Um, so mobilizing represent representational strength, legitimizing uh, China's emerging alternative multilateral architecture has emerged as a key strategic objective. China from uh, the end of the 1990s uh, to 2023 has constructed 21 new multilateral arrangements. Some of them compete directly with uh, existing multilateral institutions like the World Bank and IMF and so on. So China has a keen interest in increasing and sustaining African and larger global South participation in these institutions. It gives, the, it gives, it gives, it gives them legitimacy. Uh, it, 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 it allows them to mobilize uh, a diplomatic positions. So I think that is a, that is a key element. The other elements, of course, uh, access, you know, market access, very important. Uh, over 10,000 uh, Chinese firms that are operating on the continent. What is interesting is I was looking at data from the China-Africa Research Initiative. 
And they found that uh, the profits that Chinese state-owned enterprises are making in the construction space are actually triple the amount of foreign aid that China gives African countries over the same period, right? So there's a profit motive there, yeah. which, is, which, is, which, is, which is dominant, which we sometimes uh, 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 forget to, um, uh, to address. Norm shaping, uh, as I mentioned in the previous panel, through professional military education, uh, developing uh, uh, military, military partnerships, um, and that sort of plays into the, into the larger economic uh, uh, dimension of it. I mean, uh, uh, Chinese state-owned enterprises are either um, the sole managers or the financiers of uh, uh, over 40 port developments uh, on, on the African continent. So again, it's a mixing of commercial, political, cultural, and military uh, interest, yeah. uh, which, I think, which I think is quite evident on the continent. I th th thank you very much. I think uh, that is, if, if that's a very good roundup. I was even taking mm -hmm. notes. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like an essay uh, already lining up here. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I'm, I also meant to mention this, sorry, my apologies, that we, if you have any questions for any of our panelists, please uh, go to askac.org and type in your questions, and we'll be taking those questions in the next 10 or 15 minutes. So I, I meant to say that in my opening remarks. Uh, but now we want to go over to uh, Joseph or Joe, um, who is the Afrobarometer. And I, I'm, I'm interested in hearing more just about the Afrobarometer for those who are not familiar with it. But what is interesting is what uh, even has been said here by Paul is a norm shaping and also about the elites. Is it an elite question? So there's, there's also perceptions we need to understand. Uh, uh, is what the elites doing um, also mirrored by the populace? Are we also beginning to see any norms being shaped? Are democratic norms being shaped within the African continent? So I want to hear more about that um, and what your research is doing. All right, yeah, thank you so much, Jane. And thanks to Atlantic Council and the Q School. Really appreciate the invitation to, to share briefly about the Afrobarometer. And I'm happy to talk about what the Afrobarometer is for people who may not know. I uh, can share more about that. But just directly to, to your question whether China's influence and engagement on the continent is having any impact on democracy. And that's always a critical question that we get all, all the, most of the time. First of all, I'll just start by talking about where Africans are in terms of their commitment to democracy and democratic norms. Mm -hmm. the, the first key thing I should point out here is on the continent, throughout the period, Afrobarometer has been in this business for 25 years today. So in July, we'll turn 25. And we have surveyed Africans from across the continent over time with increased country mm -hmm. coverage from our beginning 1999 in 12 countries. We are now into 40 countries. And over this period, commitment to democracy on the continent is very solid. Right? Large majorities are committed to democracy. Mm -hmm. They prefer democracy to any other form of government. Mm -hmm. And they reject all the other non-democratic alternatives that we often would mention. One man rule, one party rule, mm -hmm. military rule. Mm -hmm. And military rule is re roundly rejected across the continent by more than three quarters of Africans. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that is something I want to put in on the table just as context. The second thing is actually the commitment to democracy, as I mentioned, is not just the D word. People really are committed to the institutions of democratic governance, whether it is free and fair elections, the presidential term limits, talk about rule of law, all of these indicators have been very strongly endorsed by majority of Africans since 2014. So over the last uh, decade, we've seen this endorsement being almost at the same level. Mm -hmm. But a critical thing we have also observed is Africans demand for accountable governance over effective ones. We often put this question to Africans. Do you want a government that is accountable even if it is not very effective? Or you want an effective government that can deliver even if it is not accountable? It started off in 2014 as a minority view, around 30%. But just in the recent two surveys, we have seen it tick up very strongly. And now it's a majority view on the continent. So there's a deepening commitment to accountable governance and people prefer their governments to be more accountable to them than just being effective in delivering you know, goods and services. And so I do think this is a, a critical you know, element of the deepening of democratic uh, um, values on the continent. 
But then to turn to your question, so how does the influence of China shape some of these views on the continent? As I've mentioned, it's, the commitment has been very strong, growing in some cases like in accountable governance. But the influence of China on the continent, first of all, the last survey round with it, we asked people, do you think that the influence of A, B, and C, whether it is China or the US or Russia, do you think the influence has been generally positive or negative or you don't know? And a slim majority, about 52% of Africans said the influence of China has been positive. About the same, so 47%, also held the same view about the United States, that the influence has been generally positive. Mm -hmm. okay. But in the previous surveys that we conducted between 2019 and 2021, we asked Africans, for the future development of your country, which country's model do you think is the best for your country to imitate? Is it the US, China, is it now a former colonial power and the like? And at that time, of course, the US was far ahead of China. So 33% chose the China model, and 22% chose the, um, sorry, 33% chose the US model, and 22% were in favor of the China model. So what we wanted to then check is, okay, if people are drawn to the China development model, does it have any effect on their commitment to democracy and democratic mm -hmm. norms? Mm -hmm. The short answer is no. There's absolutely no relationship between their preference for the China model and how they feel about democracy. If you look at the results and even separate it by those who prefer the China model and the US model, the levels of commitment to democracy, preference for democracy, rejection of authoritarian alternatives, including one party rule, as well as their commitment to democratic norms and institutions is just the same. There's no difference at all. Okay, and so that answers part of your question. Mm -hmm. We think that you know, in our analysis, one of the most corrosive factors when it comes to citizen commitment to democracy is corruption. When people feel or even perceive corruption or real corruption is being reported, then you see their commitment to democracy beginning to tick downwards. Even with that taken, we still have a majority who are committed to democratic norms on the continent, but we've seen that for countries where there's rampant corruption, that is beginning to take down. But this finding, we think it has implications for geopolitics. Because if international actors, whether it is the West or China or any other country, if we turn a blind eye to corruption for geopolitical expediency, mm -hmm then we are, you are just signaling to you know, citizens that democracy doesn't matter. And I think that's a critical view that mm. if we have international actors engaging in Africa, fighting corruption will be one of the critical things to enhance our citizen commitment to democracy on the continent. So I'll stop here, thank you. Wow, that's, that's some interesting uh, statistics coming out. And I'm wondering, is there almost some contradiction uh, beginning to emanate uh, in the continent? We have seen a especially in your, in your opening remarks, you started talking about countries are still looking to be more democratic. We've seen a lot of coups happening. Mm. Uh, and uh, even though this have not been related directly to China, they, there's still some lessons there because some of these countries are heavily uh, still investing in China. So I would still be interested to hear, do we see any kind of a contradiction? And this is actually open to uh, all the, any of the panelists. Um, this influences that the perceived influences of China in uh, in Africa when it comes to democratic principle and norms. So is is it is it just a myth, or do we believe there's something there also? Is there an ideology? All right. So I'll start from the data <laughs> side, and then I'll turn it over to my <laughs> colleagues Paul and uh, Oscar. But on, from the from the data side, when it comes to especially military rule and military intervention, mm -hmm. and we have to make a distinction between military intervention and military rule. Mm -hmm. Okay. And as I said, military rule is roundly rejected by majority of citizens. It's only in a few countries, Burkina Faso in Mali in particular, where military rule is gradually getting you know, hold of people's attention that they, they would prefer military rule to, to some other alternatives. But when it comes to you know, just thinking about military intervention in particular, when recently we asked, if your elected leaders abuse power, do you think the military should intervene? And that question about military intervention is critical because 
at least a small majority feel that if their elected leaders abuse power, the military should intervene. And there are two reasons for this. The intervention is not for military rule. It's not that they're in favor of military rule, but they want some correct correction to a country that is spiraling out of control. How do you correct what is happening now? And I think that's where the attraction to military rule comes in. But of course, also the second fact being that the military tends to be the most trusted institution on the continent. If you ask about all democratic institutions on the continent, the military is always on top of the list. And so that sense of trusting the military and feeling that they can step in and correct something that's going wrong mm. is probably what is appealing to citizens. And I don't yeah. think there's a contradiction there. They want a change. Mm. But how will the change come about? Uh, th thank you. Mm. Bef before Paul, you go, I, I also want to add an extra question to you because you've done some work on this mm. and some of the Chinese military bases uh, that are being established in the continent. Mm. Does this also, is this also a, a, a signal? Is it also showing us there could be something happening here with some kind of influence? Um, that, that's a hard question. <laughs> um, it's a hard question. But China uh, at the moment has only one mm -hmm. uh, overseas military base that we know of, and that base is in, is in Djibouti. Right. It's, it's a naval base. Uh, but if we, look at the, if we look at what that base does and the size of that base um, and the diplomatic language that China has used to describe what that base does, it's, 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 it, has been, um, it has been built as a light footprint, so-called. So for instance, if you compare it with the, with the British base in uh, in Kenya, uh, you know, it's 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 night and day. It's 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 it just doesn't. Ha it's it's not. Uh, you, you, you know, what the British have in Kenya is is of is of a magnitude that cannot be compared to um, uh, uh, to, uh, to that base in Djibouti. But I think there were other uh, elements that China was trying to exploit, and that was uh, it's not the only one in the neighborhood in the Djibouti neighborhood. There are many other foreign powers that have got military bases in Djibouti. So in that sense, it made it very difficult to kind of, uh, you know, raise, uh, you know, uh, fingers to why China is establishing this base because, you know, you're, you're basically all in the same pot. China will find it very difficult in, other, in, in, an, in, in, in any other African environment uh, because Djibouti is very, very unique in, in that sense. So um, should China go ahead and establish a base in another African country, it will be very visible. Uh, it will be very conspicuous. Uh, you know, the Chinese boots on the ground will be seen. And that is something that uh, uh, the People's Liberation Army has a very deep aversion to that for ideological, for ideological um, reasons. So that's what I would say in terms, of, in terms of that base. In terms of how China has reacted to coups, it's very interesting because uh, there's been a variation in, 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 how, in how the Chinese government has reacted to these coups. In Niger, China initially was very forceful, uh, basically demanded that uh, uh, Bazoum, you know, should be should be released, and that uh, you know China does not does not does not support uh, this the, this kind of action. But that was because the relationship with Bazoum was very close, and China had economic equities. But after a while, China became quiet, and uh, uh, you know the leadership, the military leadership, you know there were meetings and so on. And some of those equities have continued, right? In Mali, again, it was the, exa it was the exact opposite. In Burkina Faso, there was, there was silence because Burkina Faso is the, is the, is the newest, uh, you, know, you know, countries that recognize, that switched relations from Taipei to Beijing. You know, Burkina Faso is the newest. So, uh, you know, China may not have wanted to kind of ruffle, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 you know, to ruffle those feathers. So I think, um, uh, uh, you know, the Chinese reaction to the different uh, coups that have taken place in, uh, in the Sahel uh, region tell us something about China's uh, intent and its intentions. When it comes to civil society organizations, and I'm very glad, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Afrobarometer. I mean, there's no report I, 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 I do that doesn't uh, build on um, uh, 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 Afrobarometer data. Um, uh, China faces some, some headwinds. Because if the vast majority of uh, Africans, you know, prefer a democracy to one part, or to, to one party state, prefer democracy to military rule, then it means that there's not much China can offer in that space, right? Given the nature of the of the of, of the Chinese political system, and we see this criticism that mainly comes from from NGOs and and, and professionals that. Uh, uh, 
you might you know emulate or imitate uh, Chinese experiences in different domains, but not in the political mm -hmm. domain. So I think that is a that is a key element, and I think it shows that there is a sophistication in African attitudes, right? If Africans welcome Chinese influence, but that welcoming of Chinese influence does not tamp down the demand for democracy, that tells us something, mm -hmm. right? Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's, you know, that's uh, what, I, what, I, what I wanted to throw out. Uh, it would be a hard sell for China, you know, because uh, uh, the demand for democracy is very strong. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. it, it really sounds like these are very nuanced. Uh, there are a lot of layers uh, mm -hmm. happening here, and it's not just a, a binary. I think there was, there was, in the earlier panel, it was said, it's not just an easy way to look at these things. And I, I, I'm looking at uh, Oscar, yeah. uh, because uh, I, I want to also hear from your experience, especially since you've been with transparency and understanding the whole governance. If, have you seen any influences there? Uh, just just your, your feedback on that. Uh, thanks. Uh, Paul uh, has left at an interesting point where he mentions uh, sophistication in, in mm -hmm. African public opinion, and I, I totally agree with that. Uh, that resonates with my, my, my working paper I completed in October um, on the same issue and using Afrobarometer data, uh, exposing uh, variation in, in African uh, uh, perception around uh, China's uh, uh, model. And, and, and when you heard uh, Joseph speak about um, uh, how the variations, um, you know, are, are, are demonstrated. And we may, uh, for the purpose of our audience, to expose how different um, uh, publics uh, view uh, Chinese engagement. Uh, for example, uh, looking at uh, the, the coup zone, uh, especially uh, in the Western and Central uh, Africa how do they uh, perceive Africa vis-a-vis -vis, uh, relatively um, uh, open countries like Kenya, uh, Zambia, and Africa. Um, I may not have the exact, um, the exact uh, 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 digit, and maybe Joseph may, breathe, uh, more, may shed light into this, but it, it, you, you, you find that uh, countries that are relatively open, uh, you know, um, uh, hypothetically based from what I have um, I gathered before, uh, for example, uh, Kenya, Zambia, uh, what, uh, South Africa, you know, trying to uh, uh, be uh, more uh, open in terms of how China is engaging in different uh, sectors. For example, uh, in, in Kenya civil society, is very, uh, you know, relatively uh, strong compared to Ethiopia. And any Chinese engagement, uh, if it's not subscribing, for example, what our constitution talks about, uh, what uh, other legal framework like access to information is talking about issues to do with uh, disclosure, um, public participation, or right transparency, accountability. Civil society organization and other activists have filed a petition uh, to courts, and uh, the courts have had their prayers. We had uh, courts even, uh, you know, saying that uh, uh, financial engagement uh, around SGR did not conform with the constitutional principle, and and and, and that whole thing is uh, uh, should be uh, should be cancelled. So uh, that in that in it in, in itself, uh, you know. Uh, pulls uh, further the discussion on uh, democratic uh, governance and how then China uh, is aware of this uh, institutional variation in Africa to the extent that uh, in some countries it is able to carefully uh, adjust local circumstances compared to other contexts. Thank Fantastic. Thank, thank, thank you for, for those insights. And I, I want to go back to something that was mentioned earlier, that a, a the influence on China has also been quite great on training. You've been offering a lot of capacity building um, for government officials, even scholarships. Uh, so there's a lot of training. And this is going to a question that has also come in um, on, uh, on, the, on the platform. So what role, or is there any impact in any on ideological political training 
uh, of what China is offering African countries. Uh, Paul, I'm looking at. <laughs> uh, okay. uh, yeah. Uh, look, um, I would say three things. One, I think um, China, or more specifically, the Chinese Ministry of Education, has understood the value that Africans attach to education to skills building, to profession, professionalization. Uh, it is almost a mantra in Africa that education is essentially the key to everything, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's been that way for a long time. So um, the idea of improving one's educational qualifications mm -hmm. abroad, whether it's India, Singapore, Australia, it doesn't matter, is, is, is hugely popular. And I suspect that that might be contributing to the Afrobarometer, and that's the question I wanted to ask Joseph. The Afrobar the re the, you know, one of the reasons why the, uh, the perception of Chinese influence as being positive, the argument is, is often made that it's because of infrastructure. I wonder if education might not have something to do with it. Because China, before COVID, was educating more African civilians, students, uh, uh, than any other industrialized country. Uh, that changed during COVID. Uh, it's unclear whether, whether it, it will pick up, because the next forum for China-Africa cooperation is taking place this year. And it remains to be seen whether China will up that offer. But certainly, this is key. And the thing with uh, these students is um, the visa overstays in China are far less than what you'd have in the US or any other country. I think uh, the Chinese really enforce the immigration laws. <laughs> so this, this, these colleagues go back to the African continent. So I guess one might make, the, one might make an argument that China is, in fact, or rather Chinese education institutions and they're not perfect. I mean, they're all, you know, it's, 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 you know, but, but one can make the argument, one can make a reasonable, uh, reasonable argument that that capacity is being developed. But nevertheless, it is popular. As to whether um, students are swayed or professionals are swayed to go back home and kind of implement the Chinese model, the Chinese way of doing things, I think the picture is nuanced. Okay. Uh, I don't really think that, uh, I think there's a sophistication about it. And I think a lot of those opportunities uh, are really looked at as opportunities. Um, what worries me is when you compare the visa rejection rates of China and, for instance, the United States. Last year, our visa rejection rate in this country was 74% oh. of African you know, students, you know, professionals who wanted to come to the U.S. for training. It was 74%, right? Um, and it's been at that level for many years, right? Uh, when you look at the visa rejection rates of China, uh, Chinese visa rejection rates, I would suspect they're anywhere between maybe 10 and maybe 10 and 12 percent, right? So I think again that you know the Chinese, you know they understand uh, you know uh, that this is popular, but it's it's low cost. Yeah. It's low cost, but I think it's high impact. So that's what I would say uh, concerning the educational packages of the Chinese. Thank you so much. I, I could go on into a whole uh, tangent of visas, but that's for another panel. <laughs> um, <Right. laughs> Right. Uh, we, we have barely uh, two minutes left, even one minute left, and I, uh, this is where I'm going to come now seriously to the short and sweet. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. China influence continues to grow within the African continent, and Africa's role also globally continues to grow. It's beginning to make a global headways and a, and a force to contend with. So how, is this, how do you foresee this relationship going? In your closing remarks, and I'll start with you, uh, how, wh where do you see this? What's the trajectory? Yeah, I think um, in China's engagement in Africa is going to be mostly economic. The political realm is certainly not going to have a lot of impact. But on the economic front, that is exactly mm -hmm. when I see this relationship growing. And economic as well as education, as um, uh, Paul just mentioned, because increasingly more, more and more Africans are edu you know, educating in, uh, in China. And so I do see the economic engagement and the educational side you know, blossoming in the 
the near future. Thank you very much. Paul. No, likewise, I think it's, I think it's economic. Uh, but as China's economy slows, I think, uh, the, I think the Chinese are going to ramp up they already, there's already signals that they're going to ramp up on these other soft areas, culture, education, and so on, because they know that it, 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 it's high impact. Um, but I think they'll, 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 you know, we're also going to see an increase in things like strategic litigation. Strategic, strategic litigation has been growing on the African continent as a strategic tool that African communities are using to hold Chinese state-owned enterprises accountable. We've seen this being used successfully in Zimbabwe that stopped a Chinese investment in a coal mine that was, uh, that was uh, located in a very sensitive biodiversity mm -hmm. uh, park. We've seen this in Kenya with the decision of the, of the Court of Appeals uh, that came, you know, that, uh, that queried the Chinese uh, SGR. There's quite a number of, uh, of, 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 of other African countries where we're starting to see strategic litigation, you know, becoming a key tool and I think that's going to grow in the coming years. Thank, thank you, yeah. thank you, Paul. Um, ten seconds. And ten seconds. So increase, right. increase of agency. And ten seconds. <laughs> uh, to what Joseph and Paul have said, uh, allow me to add political and okay. future okay. prospects of China-Africa relation uh, will depend on political economy. And the reason why I'm saying political economy is a reference to 2021 Dhaka action plan. A lot of points were directed towards elevating political uh, engagement. For quite some time, uh, the talk has been economic, economic, economics have dominated and there are a number of uh, political issues that are now coming up, people to people exchange, for example, uh, capacity building, we talked about capacity building, and party to party uh, exchange is also taking place in a number of South African countries. Thank you very much. Right. So political. Political. <laughs> <laughs> Please join me in saying thank you to our panelists. It's been a wonderful discussion. Um, thank you very much. Um, and thank you again to the Atlantic Council and the University of Notre Dame um, School of Global Affairs. We will take a 10-minute break, but please continue interacting. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you.